Hello, Facebook Live. We are live, and I um, I've got a few questions that I'm going to be going over this evening. We've got uh, breastfeeding after breast reduction, difference between moderate plus and moderate implants, and um, on pit on pit incisions for breast augmentations. So um, that's what we've got currently lined up. If you have any questions, um, please do uh, ask them while you're uh, while you're here, and I should be able to um, see them, see the questions. They should come up. So please, um, okay, I've got that set up, so that will show me that. So please feel free to ask any questions that you can think of. Um, while, we, while, we're, while I'm on, or, or you can email or get in touch with me through Facebook if you have any personal questions, as it were, that I can answer personally, uh, or I can, um, and I can talk about them next week if you don't get in on time this week. So uh, we've got a question from Sushila. Uh, can you breastfeed after a breast reduction? Um, the very common question and the answer is it's unpredictable so so you may or may not be able to breastfeed after a breast reduction and therefore you should if you really need to or really want to be able to breastfeed then you need then I would the, the advice is finish your family before having a breast reduction because there's a chance you may not be able to breastfeed after a breast reduction Part of doing a breast reduction is you need leave enough tissue attached to the nipple because you move the nipple uh, and remove the tissue from around it. And you have to need the nerve supply, the blood supply and the milk ducts going to the nipple. And therefore the risks of breast reduction are that the nerve supply can be altered so you can have a numb or overly sensitive nipple. The blood supply can be uh, altered so you can actually lose a nipple when you do a breast reduction and the milk ducts might be divided so you may not be able to breastfeed. But all those things are mites because there might be enough tissue or it might be enough um, blood, nerve and milk ducts going to the nipple to allow that to carry on. So um, you can't really tell when you're doing the operation. You can only tell, certainly with regards to the blood supply, you can only work, tell when you've removed too much. Um, so you, you just hope that, it, that it's all OK. Um, and certainly things might feel a bit funny and unusual initially after the surgery, but then it usually comes back to life. So, uh, but sometimes not. So uh, digressing, because <laughs> the answer is, is it's unpredictable. So you may not be able to breastfeed. Two points. Number Point number one, you might not be able to breastfeed already because some people can't breastfeed. Point number two, the bigger question that I would be asking myself is not so much would you, can you breastfeed after breast reduction. Um, it is that if you're thinking of breastfeeding after breast reduction, that suggests to me you're thinking of having children after breast reduction. And the big, bigger, or maybe not bigger, but the other question is that if you are thinking of having children, then uh, imminently, again, it's usually best as to finish your family before having breast reduction, not only because of the breastfeeding issue, but because children can have an unpredictable effect on the size and the shape of your breasts. Um, so... Um, so, uh, oh no, we've got filters on. So, um, oh dear, gill there. Um, if you are thinking of, oh, take the filter off. If you are thinking of having right, uh, children, uh, then, sorry, then um, you're usually better off uh, waiting to finish your family because if you have children after a breast reduction, your breasts can get bigger when you have children. Uh, well, they always get bigger because of the milk, then they get smaller once the milk goes. But sometimes they stay big, sometimes they go smaller to what they were before, and sometimes they go back to normal. So you might have no change or sometimes the breasts droop. So children can do things to the shape of your breasts and the size of your breasts. So if you're having any sort of body contouring surgery, particularly breast reduction or breast augmentation, then it's usually best to finish your family before doing it. So you're working on a stable platform. So that that would be the bigger question, really. I would ask if you, if rather than the breastfeeding thing. But if you do, uh, uh, if you're very keen to be able to breastfeed, then don't have a breast reduction. Um, but if you do have a breast reduction, it's not it's not a write off, but it's a possibility. Um, so yes, we just had a this was just question uh, personal question for well, not personal question but question <laughs> about the about the <laughs> moderate 
the implants. Um, get a lot of people worrying about implant sizes. It's very normal to worry about implant sizes. Everybody does. Um, and I understand why you do that, because it's a big decision um, to choosing your implants. Uh, the, but what I would always say to people is that actually it's more important to choose your surgeon so choosing a surgeon is more important than choosing your implants um, because uh, you have whatever implant you choose, you um, have to get that implant in the right place. And um, if you get the implant in the wrong place, then um, you're going to get a bad result. So, um, so yeah, the implant, the, the surgeon is more important than the um than the implant selection, but nevertheless, you want to get the implant selection right. And uh, what we've just had is a, um, a, 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 a um, an interaction about the profile of the implant because we were going to use a pr pr moderate prof. We were we were uh, discussing between a moderate profile and a high profile implant, and then um, there was hi Gemma. <laughs> The comments work. Um, it was discussing between a, a high profile and a moderate profile implant, and we decided to go for a moderate profile implant. Um, and then this patient came back and said, Hold on a minute, I've seen moderate plus profile. Surely that's better, isn't it? A moderate plus profile, because that's better than a, that's a halfway house between moderate and high profile. And the problem here is it's all about terminology, and it just there is no set standard between the companies. There's lots of different companies that make breast implants. Well, not lots, but there's quite a few different companies that make breast implants. And they can choose what they call their implants. They can call them anything they want. And there is no set thing as to what a company has to call a moderate profile. Uh, where is the camera? Thanks, Claire. Where, look at the camera. Where is it? Where is the camera? Right, I'm going to... I don't know where the camera... I can't see if I'm looking at the camera. Is it over there? I'll tell you what. I'm... Okay, well, that's the camera then, isn't it? Okay, <laughs> okay, that's the camera. All right, um, I'll look at the camera. Um, is that better? So, um, yeah, there's no set thing about, uh, between um, implants. What is moderate and what is um, high profile? Uh, and there used to be a make called Silimed, which used to make polyurethane um, um, implants. And uh, as well as as well as Polytech, now Silimed no longer make the implants, and it's just Polytech. So you haven't got any choice if you want polyurethane implants. You have to have Polytech. But one of the problems I had with Silimed implants was that they were much more higher, highly projecting than the equivalent Silimed uh, polyurethane Polytech implant. Which means that if you if we went through all the thing about what profile you want, and then at the end of it all, you said you want a high profile. If you wanted a Silimed implant, I Thank you. I got to look at the thing. Um, if you if we went through it all and said, "Oh, you want a high profile implant," um, if you then wanted a Silimed implant, I'd say to you, actually, if you want a Silimed implant, you probably want a moderate profile in Silimed because Silimed implants are more highly projecting than Polytech implants. It's all just a matter of terminology, and so the similar thing happened with the Moderate Plus profile. Moderate Plus is Mentor. Mentor is a, a big company that make uh, implants and they make a they, they call one of their uh, projections moderate plus so they have low moderate moderate plus high ultra high um, but what you've got to look at is the dimensions of the implant and in this circumstance with regards to a moderate profile uh, polytech implant the moderate plus um, equivalent moderate plus mentor had less projection didn't stick out as much so just because it was called moderate plus didn't mean that it stuck out more because the moderate profile implant um, of Mentor was um, uh, was less projecting than the moderate. Oh, that's better. My screens have gone off. That's better. It's better for me anyway, in a way. <laughs> Should have turned them off. Um, oh, that's much better. And I'm, I'm looking at the camera, which is better as well. This is it. I'm improving all the time. This is fantastic. I'll get professional at this one day. Um, so it's just what the, the manufacturers call it. So just because mentor call it moderate plus doesn't mean it's more highly projecting than a moderate implant 
because if the moderate implant is a different make, it might project more. So what you've got to look at is the dimensions of the implant. But better still, you know what? I wouldn't look at the dimensions of the implant. A lot of people go out there, look at the dimensions of the implants. They email me back and they say, hold on a minute, this one's 4.6 millimetres and that one's 4.8 millimetres and that width is 11.2 and all this. They come back with the, um, the, um, the minutiae of the dimensions of the implant. I wouldn't worry too much about it um, trusting your surgeon. You know, don't get too carried away with it or trust in your surgeon and don't worry about it too much because the makes are all different. Now, I'm going to look away from the camera. Other sizes similar in silicone and polyurethane. Could I have the 420 high profile in polyurethane too? As I'm thinking, they're a better implant long term for me. Right. I've got to write this down. Um, OK, so. Um, so, yeah, so you've got to look at the dimensions. So, Amy, what I would say is. Um, we will take this offline, as they say, and uh, I'll I'll get uh, I'll, I'll talk to Laura about this tomorrow, and I will get an answer to you specifically about you and your dimensions and what you can have. But in general, answer to your question, um, the one of the reasons I like uh, Polytech implants, even when Cinemed were around, Cinemed were good implants, is that they do mirror similar dimensions to Nagor, which is the silicone implants that I use. So Nagor and Polytech are quite similar with their projections, low, medium, high, extra high, are similar with Nagor and Polytech. Nagor being silicone, Polytech being polyurethane. So between those two makes, they are similar, but with different makes, they may be different. Um, excellent, another consultation. So with different makes, they might be different. So really, what you've got, if, you, if you want to look into it, you've got to look at the, di the dimensions of the implant and the important dimensions of the width of the implant because that is uh, related to how wide your frame is and the, 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 the dimensions of the implant that your frame can take, if you like. And then the projection of the implant, how much it sticks out. Um, because as I say, just because it's called moderate plus doesn't necessarily mean that it will stick out more than a moderate implant of a different make. And specifically, you're saying about, could I have the 420 high profile in polyurethane too, as I'm thinking they're better? I don't know. <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd have to look at your notes, look at your base width. I, I, I don't know what, I can't remember what we talked about before, but, but definitely look in, I'll definitely look into that. It's awesome that you've got another appointment, 24th of May, so we can go over that. It's exactly the sort of thing we need to go over. Um, and uh, as I've probably said to you, I hope I've said to you, is that you know, we can go over it as often as you want in the clinics. It's always best to uh, be absolutely sure. So, um, yeah, so profiles, can, in fact, the whole thing can be a bit confusing, but particularly profiles can be a bit confusing when you look at people who've got different profiles and think, blimey, that looks big or small and that's, a diff and that's the same profile I was going to have and am I going to get the same result? It, it's just one of the things that's, uh, that adds to the confusion with breast implants, um, but, but you've got to look at the specific dimensions. You've also got to look at the breast you've got before you start with because you've got to obviously add that to the to the shape of the implant, but that's answering a different question, but that's a specific profile question. Um, oh, man, now my screens have gone off, so I can't... <laughs> what was the other thing? Oh, yeah, um, so that that's that. So I'm going to turn these off. Armpit scissions in breast orientation. So um, the other thing is, do I do armpit? That was Sarah, I think it was, asking about armpit incisions with breast augmentation. Um, yes, excellent. Um no, I don't do armpit incisions with breast. Oh, look at the camera. Armpit incisions with breast augmentation. Um, I the reason I don't do that. There's different places you can do the incision. Armpit, what's called infra areola, the lower border of the areola is a U, and uh, in um, infra mammary, um, infra mammary, which is the the uh, line where your bra uh, bra strap sits, or the wire of your bra sits, or often a little bit off that uh, line. Pretty much I always do inframammary. Um, they seem to do quite a lot of uh, infra areola in the US of A. Uh, they do quite a lot of transaxillary in Europe. Um, and the, because people do it different ways, as with anything, there's no good or bad about it. And if you do want transaxillary, and I do, not quite often, but I do every now and then see people who are keen on transaxillary uh, for whatever reason. And I always say to them, look, find a surgeon who's good at doing transaxillary. Uh, don't have me do it because I don't do it very often and so I probably wouldn't do it very well. You know, you need to have someone who does it, whatever it is, um, relatively often and is relatively confident with it. There are reasons why I don't do transaxillary because there's bad things about it, but obviously there's good things about it as well. Otherwise, otherwise these other guys wouldn't do it. So there's lots of good guys do it, so it's nothing 
it's not that it's all bad, but just personally, I uh, the, the the main thing about trans, the good thing about trans axillary is that it's hidden because the armpit, the incisions in the armpit, it's not a great place to have a scar. Often the scar's not great. It's difficult for he, you know, potential problem for healing because it's hot, and sweaty place. So maybe you've got an increased risk of infection. Um, so that's not so great. But having said that, even if the scar's not not very good, it doesn't matter so much because it's in your armpit and there's no scars on your chest, which is fantastic. Um, the problem I've got with the trans axillary personally, and I've spoken to the people who do do trans axillary about this, is that I struggle to get a good cleavage. Obviously, the cleavage is a really important area when you're doing this sort of surgery, and you're quite a long way when you're going in the armpit. If you can try and think of it in your own head, what you're doing with the surgery, if you try and think you're going through an incision like this in your armpit, you can't really visualize you can't really see the cleavage area very well so a lot of the surgery when you're doing is blind you're just blindly dissecting and there's a lot of big blood vessels here um, which can bleed that's what blood vessels do when you damage them and I just worry about damaging those blood vessels and because I'm worried about damaging the blood vessels maybe I won't dissect it as well as I would like and therefore maybe I wouldn't give as good as cleavage as I like and therefore I wouldn't get a good result so no good giving you no scar on the chest if you're not going to give you a good result Personally, I always use the infra areolar approach, um, infra mammary approach, sorry, um, which is the, I'm showing on myself, the, 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 where your bra strap um, sits, because I can get good access to the breast and um, I can get good access to that uh, um, cleavage area. And also, you're not cutting through any breast tissue, so whilst you might feel funny feelings, numbness, and vibrations and all sorts of funny sensations after the surgery is just due to the nerves being stretched you're not cutting through any nerves within the breast tissue um, when you go um, inframammary as opposed to doing infra areola which as I say is popular in the United States um, and, and, and Europe and again people get great results with infra areola but you are cutting through nerves and there is a potential if you do have some problems with the nerves so there's the sensation of the nipple uh, look at the camera afterwards then there is a potential that that might be a long-term problem because um, you are cutting through uh, the breast tissue itself. Um, and that, that um, does worry me a little bit. Uh, if I was doing something to the nipple anyway, you could uh, I might consider doing uh, putting the implant in through an infra areola. Certainly if I was doing a circum areola mastopexy or something like that in a tuberous breast deformity or if there are specific indications I might, if I'm making a scar there anyway, I might use that incision which would be fine, but I don't use it routinely. The other reason I don't like infra areola is although it heals brilliantly, and any man who's had a gynecomastia correction can tell you this because I, I use it routinely for gynecomastia correction, male breast reduction, and it heals beautifully that you can't see the incision when it's, uh, when it's settled. If it doesn't heal brilliantly, it's not a great place. It's right in the front in your face, whereas if the infra mammary, again, always well I won't say always but you, you know, heals beautifully in the majority of cases but if it didn't have perished the thought heal quite so well it's hidden underneath your breast so that's another benefit of using it from memory but I must say they both heal really well and again there's pros and cons of all of them and it's just a question of finding someone who can do what you want them to do and they do it routinely and they show you their results um, which are you know acceptable to you and then that's who I go for. Unfortunately, if you want infra uh, areola or a trans axillary approach, I don't even know anyone in the UK who routinely does it. Um, so I haven't even got anyone that I can re refer you to. I know a couple of guys in Europe who do the trans axillary, um, but I don't even know anyone in the UK who does um, infra areola routinely. But, you know, but you might be able to find someone with the beauty of the internet. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry about that. If you if you do want a trans auxiliary, it's, uh, I'm 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 not your man for that one. Um, so that's my questions. Uh, I, I know my comments are working, so I've got some awesome awesome comments which I can thumb up. No, I can't. Uh, I can't. It's gone all dark. Sorry. I would thumb up. Just take it as read that all your all your comments are awesome. Oh, hold on a minute. I've got a question there from Gemma. Sorry. Hold on a minute. I've already got there. Here we go. Gemma, can I ask why my scars are deeper in size than others I've seen on a fine line scar? Was comparing this with someone? Lol. Um, okay, great one. Thanks, Gemma, for that on the on the old um, chat. Deeper. My scars are deeper in size. I'm not sure if that means longer or wider. Does that mean stretched? Um, okay, first thing I'd say with regards to scars is... I think you're less than a year 
well, I know you're yesterday year, aren't you, Gemma? I hope you're less than a year, otherwise time, or has it all gone dark? Otherwise time really is flying. Um, with regards to scars, I wouldn't make any, it takes, you know, I normally say things start to settle around three months. They can say, take six, 12, or even 18 months for, to fully settle. So even if you're within a year, I wouldn't worry too much about your scars, and I wouldn't make any judgments about your scars. Um, and they usually settle pretty well, to the extent that it's quite hard to see. I'm not sure what deeper in size mean. Um, deeper suggests me like dented in but I don't think your scars are dented in are they Gemma if they are dented in like pulled in again then well if there's a problem as I say ideally if you can you need to wait about a year if there's a problem then things can be revised if they're a bit dented in like they're not flush with the skin and they're a bit dented in then you then that can be revised it's not actually as easy as you think to revise a dented in scar because you often get dented in scars but nevertheless it can be done um you can try and make it less dented in um if it's stretched which means it was a hairline scar which i think what you is might be what you're saying a hairline scar and it stretches to make it wide then again you can revise it just by excising it and stitch it up again it's relatively simple can be done under a local anesthetic um so there are things to do to revise the scars if they're not if they're not right. But from what I recall, I think everything's on track with you. But anyway, we can certainly talk about that. And if you want to come back to the clinic sooner than whenever you're due to come back, then by all means, you, then we can we can sort that out. Uh, not that I I probably wouldn't do anything if if you're still relatively early days and months are early days after this surgery. But um, but the main thing is I would say leave it because a year once it all settles, even if it is a little bit stretched. Once it settles, it becomes skin coloured, no longer red, and if, as long as it's flat and not sort of raised or dented, then um, they're usually hard to see. And you, I don't think I've ever had to do any revision to a scar ever. But anyway, you know, it's always a first time. You never know. But I suspect you're going to be okay on that one. Um, but you know. It, but we'll definitely keep an eye on it. Sorry, I'm putting my finger on. I'm not looking at the camera anymore. So, oh, here we go. Oh, you've asked. Sorry, it's um, I'm not getting my things wider. Three months, three half months. Nope, lol. I mean size, not dented in. Okay, yeah, wider. Yeah, okay. So a little bit stretched. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, three and a half months. Pfft, totally don't worry about it. The problem is, uh, three months or so, they they might still be a bit red, and if they've got a bit of colour to it, they're just a bit more obvious. And you can see them, and it's even if they're a bit stretched, you think, "Oh God, look at them! They look stretched and all that." And um, once they fade, they're, they're okay, and they're usually hard to see. And I think you'll be fine. So don't worry about it. I think you're going to be absolutely fine, but uh, definitely keep an eye on you and make sure that you are fine. So uh, thumbs up to all you all, you all who've commented. Still dark red. There you go. You see, that's the that's the thing. If this because they're red, it's never mind the. Uh, it's light going funny in here. Never mind the um, wideness. It's the red. It's the fact that they're dark red means that you can see them, and you can think, "Oh, look, they look obvious." It's not. Um, and then once that red, once they go skin coloured, you'll find that they'll be absolutely fine. So, uh, if I could do a reassurance um, sign. Oh God, sorry, I nearly blocked you then. If I could do a reassurance, I would. Uh, but I can. Oh God, sorry. Um, you can't see what's going on on my. Thing here can you so yeah all good that's fine so i am um i'm done here i'm um i'm, I'm done i've done all well i've gone through all my bits that i always want to go through as ever thank you thank you. fantastic participation today that's more like it that's what i want to see bit of um you're welcome Gemma. um oh god nearly blocked you again right um and um if, if anyone if you've got any questions join tune in uh next week seven o'clock tuesday p post them on this post or anywhere you like on uh on um facebook and i'll go through the next week and um thanks for thanks for being here <laughs> have a lot oh you're not looking at the camera have a lovely rest of the evening thanks for the tips on the uh camera or on an iphone and i'm gonna check myself out of here and i'll see you next week bye